Well, thank you for being here at uh, Conversations with the Fed, an evening with Narayana Coach Lakota, President of the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. And I was going to say that we really appreciate you coming out with all this cold. But walking over here, they would tell you it was 19 degrees. It felt balmy, what we've been going through. But no, seriously, really glad that you did brave the cold and you came to discuss economics and monetary policy. I'm Chris Farrell, economics commentator at Minnesota Public Radio and Marketplace. Narayan has a distinguished resume and just a couple of highlights. He got his bachelor's degree in math from Princeton, PhD in economics at the University of Chicago, and he became head of the Minneapolis Fed in 2009. I don't know if that was great timing, bad timing, but certainly an interesting time. And what I also learned, he spent time in Winnipeg, so he's been in a colder place than here. So it was good training. He has been a non-voting member of the rate-setting Federal Upper Market Committee, but this year he becomes a voting member, and we'll get into some details about that. So we'll start off with some introductory remarks, and then we'll get to your questions, which you submitted, and then I have a couple of my own. Thanks a lot, Chris. I spent more than a, a little time in Winnipeg. I grew up there, and uh, so this, this kind of, the kind of weather we've been going through has been, is quite, uh, quite familiar to me. In fact, I was going to say thanks for coming out on such a balmy evening as we're enjoying. So, but uh, no, but thank you all for coming today to, to take part in this public discussion about the Federal Reserve, monetary policy, and the economy. As many of you know, uh, this event is part of a broader series that we call Conversations with the Fed, which has featured presentations and issues ranging from financial payments to the health of the banking industry to the size of the Fed's balance sheet. All these, of these events have been well attended, and like good economists, we have duly noted the demand and we plan to continue to provide supply of these events in the future. So today's conversation is taking place in the headquarters of the 9th of the 12 Federal Reserve Districts. But the 9th District is a far-flung one. It includes the states of Montana, North and South Dakota, Minnesota, parts of Wisconsin, and parts of Michigan. So for that reason, we hold similar conversations throughout the district. Indeed, we're redoubling those efforts uh, this calendar year in honor of the centennial of the opening of the 12 Reserve Banks and the start of the work undertaken by the Federal Reserve System. The video that you uh, just watched gives you an overview of some of that work by the people who are actually doing it, the many employees of the Federal Reserve System. And we also have a new uh, website we've created at federalreservehistory.org. And I encourage you to visit this site to learn more about the people, places, and events that have shaped Federal Reserve history. It's a really cool website. You can uh, learn a lot from, about what's gone on in the past. And, and I was about to do this, and uh, there just, there's fascinating historical tidbits on the website that I could go on about at length, but you might not all be as excited about Fed history as I am, so I'll, I'll, uh, I just will say that if you have even the slightest curiosity about things like how the cities were chosen to host reserve banks, uh, I would encourage you to in attend uh, an installment of Conversation with the Fed on May 8th. It's going to feature Neil Willardson, our general counsel and corporate secretary, and he's going to be talking about the history of the Federal Reserve Act and answering the perennial question that uh, I get asked all the time, why Minneapolis and not St. Paul? <laughs> so I, I'm not going to try to steal Neil's thunder for that presentation. Uh, I, I have persuaded him to cut his six hours of material down to one, though. So that's, <laughs> But I, I do want to address uh, one of the things that I think has changed the most of the Federal Reserve's history and that is our communication with the public. A hundred years ago, Congress uh, created a system that was designed specifically so that residents of Main Street would have a voice in the making of monetary policy. Now, the ways in which we gather information from Main Street have obviously changed considerably over the years as new technologies have come into being. But this fact-finding, the transmission of information from Main Street uh, into monetary policy, continues to be an important part of how monetary policy gets made in the United States. But communication is a two-way two street. During the past century, the Federal Reserve's communications to the public about its monetary policy actions have also evolved greatly. The pace of change has been especially rapid in the past eight years under Chairman Bernanke's leadership. 
During that time, the Federal Reserve has specified an explicit target for inflation, begun holding regular press conferences, and greatly expanded its use of forward guidance, that is, its communications about the likely future evolution of policy choices. So as the Federal Reserve System plans for its second century, I would say that the importance of two-way communication is a key lesson from its first century. In order for the Fed to continue to be effective, it needs to communicate its policy decisions transparently to the public. Conversely, it will continue to need the public's input on how those policies are affecting them. And events like this one today are a key part of fostering that two-way communication. So with that as context, let me turn now to uh, the business at hand, the current state of the economy. Now, throughout my remarks, uh, I'll be referring to the Federal Open Market Committee, and this will show up, I, 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 I suspect, in, in my dialogue with, uh, with Chris as well, that I'll be, we'll be referring a lot to the Federal Open Market Committee, the FOMC. This is the committee that meets eight times per year to set the course of monetary policy in the United States. And the presidents of the 12 reserve banks and the governors of the Federal Reserve System all participate, all participate fully in the deliberations in those meetings that are held in Washington. But only the governors, the president of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, and four other presidents actually vote on the committee's actions. So this last set of four presidents changes annually. Um, last year, in 2013, I did not vote. But now in 2014, uh, I will be a voting member, along with the presidents of the Philadelphia, Cleveland, and Dallas uh, Federal Reserve Banks. Now, as you listen to me talk about the economy and the stance of monetary policy, uh, both in my opening remarks now but in, in, in my conversation with Chris, you always have to remember the views that I'm going to be expressing tonight are my own and not necessarily those of my colleagues on the Federal Open Market Committee. I'm not speaking for the committee in any way. Okay, so let me talk about, about monetary policy. So Congress has mandated that the FOMC should make monetary policy so as to promote two objectives, price stability and maximum employment. In 2012, beginning in 2012, the committee has explicitly translated that first goal of price stability into a 2% target for personal consumption expenditure, or PCE inflation. So this is a measure of inflation that includes all goods and services, including those related to food and energy. So sometimes, and this again might come up in our, our conversation, sometimes people make reference to core inflation, which strips away of the prices of food and energy goods. That's not what we're trying to target. We're actually ta trying to target a measure of inflation that includes all goods and services, including those related to food and energy. And that, the target we're looking for is 2%. The committee's second goal, max employment, is less rigid because long-run employment uh, is influenced by many variables outside the control of, of monetary policy. Most FOMC participants currently project that over the longer run, unemployment will be between 5 and 6 percent if uh, monetary policy keeps inflation close to 2 percent. Because those are the objectives. The objectives are uh, a 2% target for inflation, and over the longer run to get uh, uh, unemployment, the unemployment rate between 5 and 6%. So it's useful to examine the recent evolution of the economy in light of these objectives. So this is the unemployment rate over the past 30 years or so. The, uh, the gray shaded bars represent the dating of recessions, um, according to the National Bureau of Economic Research, uh, which is a um, private sector uh, group in, 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 uh, located in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And they, they date the, the times of the recessions. And uh, the most recent recession is marked as, as the, the, the gray shaded area to the, to the far right. And that uh, is dated to, at the end of 2007, December of 2007 through June of 2009. Right after the Great Recession in October of 2009, um, the uh, unemployment rate peaked at uh, 10%. It has fallen disturbingly slowly. Indeed, what you can see in this graph, if you go back to the recession of uh, 30 years ago, to the recession on the far left of the picture, you see the unemployment rate peaked at higher than 10% in uh, 
um, late 82, or actually probably in, in, into 83, but it fell much more rapidly during that, the, the following period. Okay, so that's one picture to keep in mind is that the unemployment rate has peaked, peaked at over 10, uh, at 10%, has fallen, but it's fallen slowly. Now I'll show you data on inflation. So since the beginning of the Great Recession in uh, December of 2007, PC inflation has averaged only 1.5%. This is well under the FOMC's target that I just described of 2%. So that target's marked there uh, with that green line, and it's meant to start uh, at the beginning of 2012 because that's when the, the FOMC officially declared that 2% as being its target. One thing that... I, uh, uh, this is not in my official prepared remarks, but I can't help uh, talking about this, is that um, PC inflation, this is including, as I said, all goods and services, including food and energy. That means it gets influenced a lot by the price of energy goods in particular, which swing around a lot. Um, they're very volatile and aren't very persistent. So if you, you might have a burst of inflation due to a run-up in gas prices. That doesn't tell you that inflation is going to be persistently high going forward. And a great example of that is in uh, 2008, when you see inflation swinging above 4%. That's all being driven by gas prices. If you had thought at that point, boy, inflation is going to continue to be high going forward, well, you would have been very wrong because gas prices then uh, fell very dramatically. And you see inflation actually falling below zero to minus 1% um, in, in, uh, in 2009. And this is why people often strip out food and energy goods uh, prices in order to, to focus on core is as a way to form something that's going to be a better forecaster of where inflation is going to be in the future. Because those energy goods just are masking where, 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 where uh, uh, inflation is likely to go. If I showed you a picture for, for core inflation, it would look pretty similar to this right now. That is, it would also be around 1%. So you look at the far right of this picture, where we are in terms of PC inflation, it's actually running below 1%. And uh, inflation, core inflation, if I stripped out food and energy goods, it's actually running just, just around 1% as well. So this is all about the past. What about the future? So the FOMC has said that under its current monetary policy stance, it expects the unemployment rate to decline gradually to desirable levels. It is said, too, that it expects inflation to move back toward 2% over the medium term. So by easing monetary policy relative to its current stance, the FOMC could facilitate a more rapid fall in unemployment and a more rapid return to 2% inflation. Put another way, the committee could do better with respect to both of its congressionally mandated objectives by adopting a more accommodative monetary policy stance. So that includes what I, my former remarks. Thank you uh, once again for joining us here tonight. And I look, now I look forward to fueling your uh, questions in the form of a conversation with Chris.